Take it away. What the fuck are we talking about again? Starting in the late 80s in the U.S., and that's why in every major city you sort of had a big sparking point. And it was a beautiful time for music in a lot of ways, just being reshaped and reformed. I moved to Los Angeles a week out of high school in 1987. Uh, the first show we saw that night was Husker Do. Ministry. Spaceman 3. Goth kids. Punk kids. Heavy metal guys. Kids from different scenes were, were joining these weird bands and you couldn't call them anything. There was already this just kind of untapped community of brilliance. Yeah, I mean, as far as I can tell now, it's like the last physical rock scene that I can remember. Loud, the weirdos, violent, destroying the stage, you know, just raw, raw, raw energy. We just were putting out our own records, we'd walk them around all over New York City to Midnight Records, Bleaker Bobs. But then the 90s came, and it switched it up to a whole nother element. In 91, we had Bush Sr., and we had the first Desert Storm. <laughs> When that happens, that kind of conservative reign, there seems to be a direction where the country's trying to go. And then there's the rest of us that kind of fall through the cracks of like, what? Like, that's not, that's not the plan. Like, like, I don't relate to that at all. Like, why the fuck are we over there? To eject the Iraqi army from Kuwait. It seems like that's when some of the anger in music starts to come out. Back in the early 90s, there was a sense of urgency. It felt like it was the 60s again. It was like all of a sudden you've got Soundgarden on Dateline NBC. Here you've got you know, Nine Inch Nails, Jane's Addiction, Nirvana. These bands making a difference at who the hell are these guys and why are they bigger than Guns N' Roses or Tom Petty? It's about growing up in an era that was a lot simpler and feeling lost and feeling pissed off and feeling like, no, I not only want to write songs and be a musician, but I got something to shout, you know, and I'm going to shout it in a certain direction. I'm going to shout it really loud. Music back then was like, uh, it was the way like New York was in a way. It's just the, 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 the streets were, were filled with garbage and... Nothing being perfect, just like feedback and just like dirty. Aggro, in your face, punchy. Urgh. And it was just like, this is something that's real shit, you know, it's like no joke. It was like a visceral experience, you know. I remember the music business in the 80s, it was changing a lot. The money was crazy. And then in the 90s, uh, you know, it kind of reached that plateau. I think it was 91 or 92. Whitney Houston was the number one album. The next week it was this band Nirvana from Seattle. So uh, that changed everything. When something becomes a fad, you know, when Nirvana sold a million records, who was the big band before that? Guns N' Roses. Same thing happened when Nine Inch Nails got real big. All of a sudden, everybody with the keyboard was getting a, la a major label deal. Well, where did those bands end up? There were some great local bands uh, in LA that they'd have a record or two out and then just wouldn't quite get that push, or I I'm not sure what happened, but one of my favorite bands was uh, Gwen Mars. The Afghan Wigs. Orange 9mm. Acetone. Prague. Firehose. Sunny Day Real Estate. As the first 
further we get away from it, like things get sloughed off in the history of rock and roll or whatever. It always happens. It's always being, the, the history is always being rewritten. So now people look back at the sound of the bands in the 90s and it's shorthand. People go Smashing Pumpkins and like two other bands. And that's the 90s. So that's just what happens because uh, in popular consciousness, people only know about what they're told about and those are the bands that made money. I think in maybe the early to mid 90s, I stepped back a little bit and watched as people got signed and dropped and signed and dropped and signed and dropped. And people from record companies would sign up bands and then they'd get fired themselves and uh, the bands would be left high and dry with, with, with nothing. The harshest thing about that time was how many records were made and um, just squashed. I mean, multiple people out there, players and musicians and writers and singers and who should be giant. But um, you know, you have to really dig deep to find those uh, true stories of like who's going to stand the test of time, you know. And no matter what, money is definitely not going to determine that. As long as a corporate entity can look at their balance sheet and say this thing made money, they're going to do their best to keep it alive. And the only people who are keeping the other bands alive are people who just like where it just struck them and it meant something to them. I was in a band and the first time we'd ever left Tucson, we toured to San Diego and we were supposed to open for a band uh, called Drive Like Jehu, which I'd never heard of before. started playing and I, 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 I feel like I was, was going to have a, like, I don't know, an aneurysm or something. I was freaking out. I couldn't believe it. I never heard music like that. It was completely foreign to me and super exciting and I completely changed how I wrote songs after seeing that band. I mean, a lot, a lot of the bands that came out at that time didn't exist to, to just get signed and make it. and live in the lap of luxury and live in a mansion and all that it wasn't i don't think it was really i don't think it was really a, about that look at the 90s like you take all the bands from the 80s all the musicians and you give their younger brothers and younger sisters guitars right and then those people those younger brothers and younger sisters start bands and they're that basically defines the 90s to my in, my in my opinion you know like we're all the kids that were the younger punk rock kids starting to make music as a as a young kid i guess i was 14 or 15 in a nutshell a friend of mine was killed in a motorcycle accident out running the police uh when he went after the funeral was done i knew a way to break into his house because we used to switch in and out the windows all the time but I went through his house and I stole his guitar. I was like, I'm gonna learn how to play this thing because he was pretty good at it. And the only thing I knew at the time was ACDC and Ramones. So I started pounding chords and figuring it out and going one, one day at a time. And it made sense to me. It was an outlet for me. You know, the rich kids went to psychiatrists and poor kids like me played punk rock guitar.
music to me meant a movement. You know, the um, I like the passion of it. I like how people change when they listen to it. Then it sort of became my best friend and a way to like deal with the uncertainties of life and the pressures and the, you know, the heartaches. And it became sort of a, a garden or a solace, a place where I could, you know, escape. If you arrive at the place and you see a line outside, that's automatically gonna get your your whole insides bubbled up. You're gonna go, oh damn, okay. You're gonna get pumped up. The people are gonna get pumped up. Everybody's thinking about what's gonna occur that evening. And if the first note you hit on stage when you hit it, and you look out in the audience and it's packed, if the first note is good, you go, oh. oh. This might be the one, boy. And then after you get one, two, three, maybe four songs in and crowds into it, it's about to explode. Then you hit that one song at that point that just, uh, ah, just the whole everything blow up. That's when it's just like God just opened up the ceiling of the joint and put his hand in and started slapping the hell out of people. Pow, pow, pow. That's what it's like. That was a time of, like, I was living here and there were a couple clubs that were just designated for this kind of music. The clubs were CBGB's, there was a pyramid club over on Avenue A, had transvestites dancing up on the bar and then you go out the back and watch L7. Down and dirty, open for late, late sets, you know, this is the days where people played at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, you know, so you had all night to drink. It's not like it is now, or it's like, you know, everybody get out! When people talk about the 80s in popular culture, they're talking about, they typically talk about stuff like Prince and Janet Jackson and Cyndi Lauper and Madonna. I mean, you know, pure shit. The reaction against that was a whole slew of really distinctive, really odd, ugly bands in the underground, bands like Sonic Youth and Killdozer. Bands like Youth of Today or Sick of It All. Bands like Killing Bird, Jack and The Swans, Diggs, The Bungle Surfers, like and The and, you know, Hammerhead stuff. I felt like they were my band, you know? Because I was like, nope, there's no way this is ever going to be on the radio, and I like it that way. And then these connections happened, and they sort of ran very deep. There was an exclusivity to it, and you had to go to the special record store. You had to know where the right club was. So that time, you know, made music really exciting. And it made it really easy for a band to go, hey, this is a great time, let's go on tour. Let's, you know, scrounge up all the money we got, get some, get a van and just go for it because, because bands were doing it. You know, that's like the great value of, of this scene that was growing into like a global network. Being a band, a band of brothers, people you love, people, you know, you may, hate at times or you fight where you always respect and, and you, you know, and that kind of thing. That was the dream. Got into a car, I you know, wore my drums on my lap and everyone else wore their equipment in their lap and the singer drove, you know what I mean? Yeah, there were no hotels or anything like that. We would find someone to put us up for the night, someone to sleep out in the van keep your gear safe. We toured America like crazy. We'd just get in the van and do these really crappy tours with, you know, no money and just enough to fill the gas tank and get to the next town and sleep on people's floors. That's what it's about. I mean, that's how it was back in the day, that, you know, and that's how, unfortunately, no, no, I shouldn't say unfortunately. Fortunately, that's how it is again now. You have to tour. You know, the, a band has to tour to be successful. 
we're Brits, you know, so so what do Brits do? They complain. That's that's what you do, you British, you complain. So we would complain, you know, the van was hot, the van was too cold, we're sleeping in the fucking van again, it, it, it's crap. You know, and to be fair, a lot of it was crap, it was very difficult. You know, you used to talk about musicians, you're either nuts or it's really what, who you are and what you want to do with your life. And it was just fucking incredible. It was brilliant, yeah, we went there with the Melvins, we shared a van, Buzz's thing, uh, Buzz's thing was farting in the van, that was the, you know, it was fucking freezing. You're driving through Vermont and w in, in, through snowdrifts in winter, you've got to keep the windows up. And he would just torture everyone by farting, and laughing and laughing and laughing. Yeah, F farting, farting in a van uh, on the road is, is heavy and hard. It's hard on people. It's hard on, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, what I'm trying to say is like farting, farting is, is a foul display of, of aggression, I think. It's aggressive, it's, uh, it, uh, sometimes it's an accident. Played a show at the Pyramid. The Melvins and Nirvana were also on the bill. Nirvana had the original drummer. And Paige watched the Melvins who were doing everything in drop D tuning. So I think you got the idea from then. If I could hold your feet down, get to know for a while. And then drove down to the south side of Chicago grabbed a couple of hours sleep on a pool table. Then we went off and we toured the west coast with Tad. And we toured with Jawbox as well. I was good friends with um, the guys in Sugar Tooth. I'd always go see them. It's always a really crazy time. <laughs> real friendship there and just sort of a kick of being together and there were some times when there was three or four people in the room and we still would play. We would kill it too. Kill I mean, those were the best shows, it was like, man. We would it was kill always them. a great time because we loved to play. I, at that point I'd never seen a drummer like Joey. Um, I'd never seen a badass Latino cholo gang banging punk rocker bash the drums like John Bonham. I think we got held up with a gun in New Orleans and he broke a cinder block over the guy's head and back. Unbelievable. And at that time, no, you know, the idea of being commercially successful um, wasn't even, it wasn't even considered really. It wasn't a possibility. But that didn't stop people from enjoying what they did. Was the time I would have cried in those days of all gone by. I always walked the crooked line and so did I. You know, I really loved Kotsu Kop in it, and especially their lyrics because I just thought he was the most hilarious, like twisted, dark lyrics of, of, of all time, but actually quite relatable as well. The first Kotsu Kop release was Head Kick Facsimile. We had to look as far as, or, uh, it was a label called Supernatural Organization uh, from Tokyo. This is, <laughs> this was, you know, where we had to look to find somebody that was willing to, you know, bother, bother actually putting a record out by, by the likes of us. The first record, we went and we recorded in, uh, in Jersey, and I remember Half the shit was broken every time we tried to do something, it, was, it didn't work. And, and we ended up 
finishing the record, but we had to cut it short because two of the guys in the band caught crabs. I mean, back in the mid to late 80s, we lived in horrible basement apartments in New York City. There was no no way to get radio. It's It just wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't possible. So we didn't really even know what was going on in the real world as far as what was popular in music. And they just bought that these building. People these people don't are getting realize evicted. that they're going to get thrown out. You know, we didn't have televisions. We didn't, we, we never even had a phone. We couldn't afford a phone. So I, I don't know, You're, we were very much in our own world because of that too. When I came to Chicago in 1980, I saw the weirdest assortment of people at punk shows. Their collective identity was that they had no shot outside in the straight world. Like they, they really couldn't handle the straight world. So they gravitated to places like the punk scene where you could be slightly insane or prone to fits of violence or, you know, cover yourself in house paint or you know have a thing for fucking dogs like you could you could be one of those people and it wouldn't be an obstacle to you being a participant Thank you. there was a sense that like this is a thing that's being willed into being and being propagated by the subculture people who are just like didn't want to take what was given to them they wanted to do the thing that came from within <laughs> that the only dream didn't have to be the dream of getting on a major label. There was another way to do it, and Fugazi was the band that did it amazingly well. I felt was so important about the underground scene was that it was completely unfiltered and it made me a much more open-minded person. Interacting with people like that on a day-to-day -day basis gave me the perspective that every single person has something in him of value. Every single person is a worthwhile person. Now it was, it was six years later, you saw bands that were immediately signed and their first tours were being done in you know, enormous buses with tremendous amounts of money being, being thrown on them. I mean, we, we watched this happen in a very short frame of time. And when the, the climate changed, it was so weird. It was almost like the other way around. <laughs> we went from thinking, you know, we're, you know, getting in the van and, you know, schlepping our own gear to all of a sudden, immediately like a $200,000 budget for a video. We had tour support. Our first show ever, we had a friggin' tour bus and we had a crew. I had, you know, my own guitar tech and I, I could barely friggin' play guitars. It's Rich and I are in Europe doing a 27-city press tour with um, Chris Isaac, of all people, he's, God bless him, one of our friends, and this thing is picking up momentum, and we get back, we're like, okay, you guys start touring next week, and you're sold out all summer. When things like this explode, when, it, when a scene like this explodes, 
it, a really happy time happens where big guys with lots of money don't really know what's going on, but they want to be part of it. So this small vacuum that goes, okay, sign everybody. Okay, let's form a line over there with your checkbooks. The difference back then was MTV was actually a relevant entity. If you were an MTV band, if you were a buzz bin band and you were being played every two hours, we sold 70,000 copies a week. If you can get up in there with the right tools, the right thing, the right look, boom, you good. But for how long are you good? You gotta be really good to keep going. So everybody started like loosening up their fashion sense and just kind of turning up and rocking the fuck out and singing songs about being lost, being high, being angry. And MTV would show their Michael Jacksons and Stings and all that shit. And then late night, Sunday night, they would have this uh, video show called, what was it, The Cutting Edge or something like that? And they would show these kind of indie college rock underground bands. That's where you would see your Sonic Youth and Butthole Surfers and Dinosaur Juniors and all these bands. And um, all of a sudden, MTV started showing them during the day, like prime time. At that point, that, was, that is during the time that it seemed like major labels started going, hey, wait a minute, maybe we should start looking at these bands, you know? And at, at that time, we heard um, Helmet. They were combining punk and they were combining metal and, and these weird influences. And then when I went to see them, they were just so tight and pro and simple, but yet this underlying complexity. I still don't know what to call a helmet. I don't know what to call quicksand. Helmet was definitely one of the, the fire starters when it came to like, we gotta sign more bands like this. touring for probably a year and a half or so and we'd seen ourselves go from maybe playing in front of 30 people to uh, at one stage before Mean Time came out where we sold out a, a thousand seat venue in Chicago headlining. And they were all of a sudden in like 90, 91 getting signed to Majors and then Nirvana got signed to Geffen and Sonic Youth got signed to Geffen. Uh, Interscope had Primus at that stage, the Smashing Pumpkins were making the move from Caroline up to Virgin. Uh, Ministry had been around before, um, before the whole the whole wave hit. REM, Red Hot Chili Peppers were around before, but all of a sudden uh, bands were going out and getting $400,000 of record firm deals. There, there was nothing, nothing exceptional about that in the longer run. We started getting courted by all the um, major labels. Label flew us to New York, you know, put us in the most, you know, the most badass hotel in, you know, town in their, cars. and yeah, town cars <laughs> driving us around. People sending limos and getting taken out to lunch. We were going to dinner every week. We were getting yeah. taken to dinner by, I mean, a different label every week. Rick Rubin, I remember riding around in his Rolls Royce with him and going to bars with him just to like kind of, you know, hey guys, join our label, you know, we're like, I don't know, Rick Rubin. <laughs> it's like, that's not kind of our thing. Everybody was getting signed. Everybody I knew was getting signed. It was just a feeding frenzy. Labels were just signing almost everybody. But you know, you take an artist like Beck. So Beck broke out of college radio. People were showing up at his house. A and R people like were swarming, you know, to sign this guy. A and R is basically find him, sign him, navigate the waters of making a record, which with every band is a completely unique and different experience. Deliver the record to the company, live and then live and breathe it for the entire album cycle. 
whether it's a massive success or a crash and burn. Interscope approached us, um, and for some reason she came up to me after the show, and I just didn't like her at all. I didn't like anything about her. She just, so I, she, when she handed me the card, I promptly threw it away, and told <laughs> and told them in the van the next day, or maybe the day after that. Oh yeah, somebody from Interscope. This girl is just really horrible person, thinking, uh, just talking a load of shit, and I, they nearly threw me out of the van on the spot. Todd was just furious with me. <laughs> I had fucking thrown our dreams out the window. I said, no, no, she's just, just an awful person. If some band had sold a certain amount of records, like independently, like the major label thought, well, if we just added money to that, we could sell, proportionally, we could do the same amount. And I would have people calling me saying, look, you know, Dude, this is how we this is how we sell four million records. You get Michael, you get Michael Barnhorn to do the record. You get Kevin Curse like to do to the radio. You get Epic to work it. Now, when we sell four million records, and when we sell four million records, I'll spend my holidays in rehab, and everyone can kiss my ass. What's the quarterly return? We just signed this band. They sold fifty thousand records on their indie. We need we've spent this much. We need them to sell triple or quadruple that amount. Is that possible? One, two, three, four. I think it was definitely the Seattle explosion. I think it was definitely those bands going and selling, you know, triple platinum. They built a really strong foundation and then went to take that, that jump, that leap. You know, all of a sudden, you know, the kid who was pumping gas one week in San Diego, Eddie Vedder, is now on cover of Time Magazine as the voice of a generation, you know. But the smaller bands like the Jesus Lizard or Claw Hammer or Cop Shoot Cop, I mean, there were all these bands that were like, how is this going to translate? And it was like, a, all right, it's kind of an experiment. We're going to see if we can make this, if we can turn this into another Nirvana. Our first single, our first release with them, was to make Ten Dollar Bill the single that featured uh, uh, this dwarf who was lip syncing the lyrics. So we thought, wouldn't it be funny to have a marching band, you know, with uh, ill-fitting clothes, a bunch of drunkards wearing marching band uniforms and midgets and carnival people involved in, you know drunkenly going down the street playing this, wouldn't that be a good video for this song? And then we thought, oh, you know, we actually have a label that would pay for us to do something like that. We can, now we could do something like that. You're supposed to overdo it. You're supposed to start off humble and you're supposed to lose your mind. You're supposed to like jump the shark and you're supposed to blow up and die. So, you know, the, the big difference um, for us for surgery uh, after we got signed to Atlantic Records in the great Nirvana, post-Nirvana feeding frenzy of noisy bands was, um, you know, making a, a record, a big major label record for the first time. And going from having a budget for our record of, I don't know, $5,000 to having a budget, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you're going from like sweating your asses off, playing really loud in a really small room where you're practically bumping into each other to these cavernous, beautiful, big, legendary studios that were built to fit Frank Sinatra in an orchestra or, or Nat King Cole in an orchestra, you know. Yeah, just being able to to have proper equipment, 
you know, to be able to afford proper amplifiers and sampling gear. And I could tell when you, by the fruit bowl, you go into a studio and they, they got apples and bananas, you're like, that's ah, a nice studio. But if they got like kiwi and shit in, in the fruit bowl, you're like, we've arrived, man. That's like an imported fruit, you know? <laughs> You could afford to keep an apartment while you're out of town, and you could afford to just play music every day. And also do really fucking ridiculous shit that I've always wanted to do, like rent Katz's Delicatessen for three hours to have a record release party, or go to Mexico for four days with a bunch of midgets and make a film. So, what was the question? And so that was like a real, like a beautiful, I have like a wonderful, glow of a memory about that time because having the luxury of taking several weeks to just be making a record was amazing. And with, uh, especially with Scream Dracula Scream, we suddenly had all this money to try different things. We just kept adding on and adding on. Oh, let's, well, this string section, great. This, great. Oh, car screeching in the parking lot, great. Let's put it all on tape and make it happen. Fill the gaps that the guitars, the bass, and the drums weren't filling. To, it was the whole wall of sound idea. You know, so we were just young kids who now had a chance to do it on a bigger scale, not really thinking that we were going to be Metallica or anything, but we just wanted to write a grandiose big song. And that was our trip. So anyway, everybody's getting signed, everybody's getting big overnight. We go out on the road. We were out there just blowing doors on the small stages for Lollapalooza and uh, just tore it up. Yeah, it was basically like we were in our late teens out of control with the budget. That tour was one of the most, was one of my favorite tours ever do because it was the, the epitome of a rock and roll tour. I mean, it was, you know, the fans and the, the sex, drugs and rock and roll. That's what it was from day one to the end of that tour. It was just crazy. Another major factor in the scene, the sound, the aesthetic was the drugs that were going around. This couple comes up to me as I'm, you know, walking to the bus and uh, the guy says, hey man, you know, we really loved the show. You know, we sat up all night, you know, uh, shooting speed, listening to Screw getting ready for the show. We really love it, we really love it. We, we take my wife on board the bus and fuck her. Well, during those times, the 90s, we was just going pretty much nuts anyway, you know. It was the drinking, smoking, uh, you know, here we go party time. But we were dead serious about that music, though. We would always go into a studio. We were never the kind of band that would take, all right, we gotta do this record cheap and get out of here and, and split some cash up. We knew that that stuff was going on a CD, it would be done forever. So we're gonna go to Electric Lady in New York City to make this classic record that will never be made again. You know, one of the bigger things for us was when we had done this record, Deliverance, we were doing it on a, 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 a smaller budget, a label called Relativity. And, uh, you know, somehow Donnie Einer and the president of Columbia got a hold of it and heard what we were doing, and uh, Relativity Records wouldn't let us go because they knew they had something good. Also, a lot of heads of these major labels were changing. So you got the, the, the old dogs now replaced with the new dog, and, and it doesn't matter what dog, because everybody's still afraid for their lives, and everybody wants the next big thing. And uh, we all got signed because Nirvana got successful. 
now there's this pressure to keep it going. And I remember one day Donnie Einer called me on the phone. I was in New York City. He goes, go buy the New York Times and go to the financial section. I was like, why? He goes, just do it. I went there and it said, Sony Music acquires 51% of Relativity Records. Hey, hey. And then we were like, oh my god, it's almost like it's almost like they're behind us, you know? Like, look, we made a video that's actually on MTV and we're touring with Stone Temple Pilots and all this stuff shouldn't work. And then, you know, conversely to that, you know, when your record comes out, they start keeping score. By our criteria, it was really working great. We were like, oh my god, who knew? This is fantastic. By Atlantic Records criteria, it was an absolute stone flop, like it was a complete failure. It was like the least accessible record that we made. And one of my favorite bands, I'm from Baltimore originally, so I grew up kind of immersed in the Baltimore DC scene. I love Jawbox. I remember meeting their A&R guy and he was convinced that Jay Robbins was like the next John Lennon. Like he was so like, this is gonna be the next biggest band. I mean, he was so passionate about the band. And then the label ended up putting him on tour with like Stone Temple Pilots or something. And their crowd just didn't give a shit. It used to be the case that bands used to go out and develop a following and people came out and saw them because they put on a good show and they liked what they did. With the major labels, it turned into an entirely different proposition where um, you know, the tours were constructed, the, the lineups were determined by record companies, management, booking agencies. We went out for a week or maybe a week and a half with a band called Mercury Rev. I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with that band. Great band, but they are like, it's like ACDC opening up for Pink Floyd. It made no sense. We toured with Silverchair. Nice kids, nice guys, actually really nice guys. Had a nice time with them, but I don't think that we connected with the 15 year old female audience. I mean, I got the general sense that, you know, people were working in the music industry and just really didn't know anything about music. I mean, you had so many bands getting signed. You had so many bands who thought they had identities and, and, and or knew they had identities, yet, did the label or did the people working for them exactly agree that that was their identity? I mean, uh, there was one particular thing where there was an advert in Rolling Stone, I think it was a spin that came out with Fudge Tunnel, England's answer to Nirvana. For one, we didn't want to be seen as a, as a grunge band. And for two, we didn't want anyone to buy the album thinking it was going to be as good as Nirvana or that it even sounded like Nirvana. Which any idiot could have told you that, but it was great because at that time, all bets were off and nobody had any, it was like the major labels were just going like, they didn't know what to do. During the, that era, Warner Brothers like fired the whole rock, hard rock metal department. Headbangers Ball went off the air, um, but yet there were still great bands out there doing great things. After the first record had, had run its course, and, and I think it had run its course prematurely, the classic form, the label didn't think that the second single was going to, didn't pop as quickly as they thought, and rather than spend money on tour support, let's just you know, call this thing dead. When we got home, there were some questions about when we were going to be going back on the road again and when we were going to be making a second record. And so, uh, so Joey joined uh, Danzig at that point. The Zig. The Zig. <laughs> we came home to sort of lick our wounds and 
you know, reform. And we lost one of the key components of the band. We lost our drummer, who was not only our drummer, but he was one of the world's greatest drummers and irreplaceable. We were put out on these ill-fitting tours. Um, and I think consequently the record, you know, was, according to the label, was dead in six months. And it was time to come home and start working on a new record. They, it's almost like, now I'm a newcomer to this kind of major label thing, so you're being wined and dined and told that you're this and that, and, and you're like, wow, that sounds, thank you. Like, that's great. Thank you for the really expensive lunch. Like, to find out later that you're paying for it all. It's all coming out of, you know, nobody's, none of these A&R guys are your buddies or, or buying you lunch, you know? You're buying them, they should thank you. Pretty soon I, re I realized that, uh, that they give you money and then you owe them this, this creative thing in return. And it depends if you're on an indie label, any of those are usually like, here's the money, go make the record, try not to spend it on drugs and give us a, you know, deliver us a record at the end of the day. Uh, major labels, the more money that's invested, there tends to be more pressure. And as we were talking a little earlier, you know, sometimes that moment of being signed to a label is, well, you know, if, if a band can survive being signed, that's almost like, that's pretty amazing. One of the biggest issues was the US tour where we really wanted to go to the States. We knew we had a lot of fans in the States. And so they said, you need to do a video for your, for your song. And we said, all right, we've got some friends that do a really good video. And they went, mm, I don't know, well, let's just try it. So we did a, a video with, with our friends who, it was absolutely excellent. We loved it. Columbia felt sure that it wasn't ever going to get played on MTV. From my perspective, which was still very naive, so I don't know how accurate it is, but they, we were forced to spend like $350,000 making a record. Did we make a better record when we had a lot more money to spend? No. You don't need that much money to make a record. You know, and of course, like everybody else, we didn't fully comprehend at the time that we were only spending our money. So out of that, you've got to pay for your recording costs, your percentage of video costs, your promotions. You've got to pay for your road crew, your hotels, uh, for the vans, for equipment. Like, I know bands that have had gold records and couldn't pay their rent. The hype all the way up, the whole signing process, you guys are huge. You guys are going to be it. You're the next, you're the next big thing. And they start saying, they always say the same things to the bands. We, I feel what you have. What you have is real. I, I, I feel it. But when they turn around and talk to their partner with their accounting, we can make a lot of money off of this band. It's, it's the music industry, it's business. It's the way it is. We had to hire a big name LA director to come all the way to Nottingham and, and do a very expensive $100,000 video that MTV would for sure play. We rang up Columbia and said, yeah, we're not going to do this sort of video. We're, we're happy with the one we have. We don't want to spend $100,000 on a video. It's ridiculous. And they said, oh, OK, so I guess you're playing, you're paying for your own plane tickets to the States then, aren't you? And that was the moment when we had this realization of, of what was going on, that we didn't have any control. So yeah, I mean, people freaked out, and the, the big guys came in, and they did what record companies always go. They come in there with a cigar in their mouth and, I love what you kids are doing. You know, why don't you, you know, you come here and you'll do it with us and we'll, we'll, we'll play it for everybody. And it'll be exactly the same as what you do, except more people will enjoy it. And of course it never works out that way. So that was our first sort of taste of what it meant to be working with a major label where, you know, any anything that's said is, you basically read between the lines. I can't speak for anyone else, but I'll just say I'm glad that I moved on when I did because in the end, Henry and John ended up, from what they've told me, $200,000 in debt to the record company. Henry stopped playing bass. He now plays uh, Hawaiian and Caribbean music, I think. Um, and John stopped playing drums for two years. So, um, no, I'm 
was very, very happy that I managed to uh, depart when I did and go off and form Handsome. So, okay, let's, let, let's, let's look at this in a little bit of hindsight. Was it the most responsible or sort of perceptive thing to expect the likes of Drive Like Jehu, Jawbox, or Rocket from the Crypt to deliver records that were going to change the course of the mainstream? Probably not. They were great, you know, these are great bands and these were bands whose records deserve to be heard. But the key mistake was record companies investing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into these bands. There's nothing different about this, what happened to these guys, than any other American record scene before, or UK record scene, by the way. Like when the Knack was big and they signed every band with a the in the title. Yeah, like and in the 80s, yeah, the Knack. They dropped them within like three weeks, you know, so. And everybody's like dead men walking three years later. We were not fans of what was coming out of Seattle. We emphatically disliked Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and these fucking bands that all dressed like Rory Gallagher and just sounded like every garage band that I grew up with in the 1970s. We did like some of these Seattle bands when they first came out. But I think, if anything, the, the thing that we loved the most was the Chicago bands, because the Chicago bands had this, this sort of nasty, horrible sense of humor about them that really appealed to us. The, the majors came to Chicago quite a lot. Like, they went to Seattle. And then they came to Chicago after the Pumpkins got big. In Chicago, you had bands like Tar and the Jesus Lizard in particular, who, for my money, were the band of that decade. Like, by far, the best live band that I've ever seen, and easily the best musicians I've ever worked with in the studio. They demonstrated by carrying their own weight on the road, bringing in an audience night after night after night, that you didn't need to compromise. You could make weird extreme music. You could live like a crazy person. You could do it all with handshakes and head nods and be something of a success at it, you know? Toward the end of their run, they did sign to a major label and that was sort of began an arc that ended their career. But there was a period of about five or six years there where they basically didn't put a foot wrong. You would think that, and probably a lot of bands did have the wherewithal to know the indie labels are the better route for us, but it's really hard when the majors come along with the money, with the prestige, and even though you, you might, like, you, like if you're a band that's so so left of center that you know you're never going to be the next Beatles. The allure of the major label was was really hard to deny. All right, welcome to the whiskey. I'm Carson Daly from K-Rock, and it's a real uh, pleasure to introduce this next band. I'm a big fan of theirs. They've been on the road, but they're home tonight. Please make some noise for failure. You know, it was all about the feeling you got when you looked at the back of the KISS record, you know, and when you went to the concert and the adoration and the, um, the idea that if I was that guy, everything in my life would be perfect. Everything would be okay. I'd have everything I'd want. Everybody would love me. So caught up in the tree of 
When you take something out of its natural habitat, you know, here's an amazing tree that's flourishing in this habitat. And I'm like, I want that tree in my yard. Well, that tree only lives in the South. But there's something that happens, I think, when you, um, take a band, a single band, uh, out of its community and then put it into the major label system. The major label system, it's, you know, the developmental process is, is not really there anymore at all. I mean, it might have been in like the 70s when, you know, or the 60s when Aretha Franklin could put out seven albums and no one would know who she was until her eighth album. You know, it's like that does not happen anymore. And so that tree might die because it's not getting what it needs. For the second record, we were, we were, we were, for the first record we were this. We were maybe a modern day Black Sabbath. But my biggest musical influence was David Bowie. And one of the things that I had taken from that was every record was different and he pushed himself and I thought it was really it kept him interested it kept the fans interested and so I had no interest of doing the first record again so you know we got um, we got involved with samples and drum machines and then looking for a um, some producers I would called the uh, Dust Brothers up some folks say that Willie Green was the baddest motherfucker the world ever seen. In the late 80s, early 90s, I, the most important advent, I, I, I think, since the invention of, uh, you know, amplified guitar, it was the sampler and digital technology. Dolomite is my name and fucking up motherfuckers is my name. The fact that a whole genre, uh, hip hop, came out of it. Public Enemy and Paul's Boutique by the Beastie Boys. A, my paradigmatic example of this sonic chaos that we all used as a reference point. We were both, I mean, Josh and I were both fans of Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique, and you know, we started going through their catalog, like this shit, this shit was amazing. And what I really liked about it was that they were thinking completely differently than we were. They, why would you just use one guitar and the same amp in the same song? Why don't we use 10 guitars and 10 different amps for all the different parts? And all of a sudden, oh, the doors are open. God damn, mama. This was a spooky job. So when I was away touring with Danzig and then came home and got the call from the guys and you know, they sent me the material, which I still have, by the way, on a cassette. I found it right there, yeah. And I was like, holy shit, man. It's like, it was, I was blown away. I want you to light up a joint. Get your hands together. Let's hear it. I'm pimping rock. The sort of last piece of the puzzle at that point was the lyrics and maybe even some melody. And the label wasn't going to release the record unless they felt like the songs were strong enough and had single potential. And so all of a sudden the pressure was on, and it was on me because I was the lyric writer and the melody writer. With most bands, the first album, they take a long time to build that album and make that album just so like, yeah, that's the bomb. Then you got your second album. And if your second album don't come out like that first album and make that first album money, oh, it's a heartbreak, a heartache. Creativity meets commerce. And they go smash, 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 smash. And like, what's gonna happen? You can almost hear the struggle on certain records. Yeah, when, when you're, you know, in that environment, as stressful as it was, it was you're pent up. It was a stressful time. You know, we weren't recording together. Um, we weren't getting along. 
uh, our producer was fighting with our guitar player. Having said that, all these crazy negative energy created a volcano. Course of Empire, signed to Zoo Records about the same time shortly after Tool. Infested, the metaphor was uh, maybe we're the thing that is infesting the planet. So we tried to use guitars and drums to create the sound of infestation. And so the guitar became more of a percussive instrument than a melodic instrument. And it was all just to create this juggernaut of drums and tribal energy. Course of Empire was one of those records you listen to it and you go, wow, this is good. And then you just never hear. And then you go and talk to the AR guys and go, what happened to that band Course of Empire that you had there? Oh, they're making a new record. Oh, what happened to the last record? Yeah, you know, yeah. And it was always a common refrain of you know, we could never get it off at radio. If you wanted to have a career as a band in the 90s, you had to get on the radio. <laughs> and K-Rock was one of the, the biggest radio stations you could get on. You could get on some podunk stations, in Mesa, Arizona, or whatever, but if you wanted to have a career, you had to get those big stations in Los Angeles, in New York, the end in Seattle. These were the stations that launched your career. The label would come in, meet with you for 15 minutes with a stack of CDs, which were called their priorities. So the first CD, you know, is their first priority, and the second priority maybe you're paying attention to, but third priority on down, forget it. You know, uh, you're just going to be simply like a tax write-off. When we were on tour with guys who got, they got their tour support cut in the middle of the tour, they got dropped by the label, and we would go between shows, and I'd be like, hey, I forget, was it uh, Sweetwater? We were touring with Sweetwater. Oh, yeah. And we had like a two-day drive, and we got, it was like in Texas, and we got there, and we were like, well, what happened to Sweetwater? And like, they got dropped by the label, and they just drove home. And uh, I've seen it, and where musicians, they just go into a downward spiral. They don't, some of them don't come back, and some of them do, you know? So it's a devastating thing, because you're at the top of your game going, wow, this is great, I'm doing my thing. And then it's like, guess what, guys? You're not making the cut, you know? It's like being on a football team, you know? It's like, you're out of here. So it can, it can affect, it affect you. Because it's kind of hard to pick up the pieces once, once you're your kind of dream gets crushed in a sense. Um, you know, not a lot of bands can walk away from that and, and continue on with the same love of what they're doing. Never fails. They always go back. Back to what they know. To the scene of the crime. Just cruise by for one last look to clear the head. And when will a man learn? Well, I think I'm most known for a, a band called Brad, and uh, we released a record in 1993 and uh, features uh, Stone Gossard from Pearl Jam which is why a lot of people got to hear it.
Sean is really the real deal. I mean, Patton's the real deal too, but there's something about Sean. I don't know when I've worked with a singer of that level of Sean where it would just floor you when he just starts singing. I got suffering on the radio. And here's where, you know, politics comes into play. Suffering was on a soundtrack for a movie and then was also on the label. And there was sort of a disagreement because the label was pushing a different single. The soundtrack was, you know, I don't even think they were pushing that single. Neither one of the labels sort of steps up to say, okay, yes, we're going to join forces with you and push this single. And so that song got on for maybe like 30 spins and was gone. The more I learned about the business side, the less I wanted to do it. Um, because it, it didn't it didn't reconcile itself with my dream of making music. And I came in and uh, I remember saying to the record company after Dope's Infinity came out, which was our second major label release, how come this stuff isn't bigger? Whatever I make, you should be able to sell. If you could sell a million zillion packs of cigarettes in one day, you can sell Monster Mac. I was mad, you know, I was really, really mad. Um, you know, because I was still under the belief that, you know, what I was doing was all about making music, making great music, which is what turned me on to wanting to be a musician in the first place. I didn't have this other, you know, the stuff that a lot of the other indie bands have with like, no one understands us. And I was like, I don't give a shit if they understand us or not. You guys should be able to sell anything. You're record people. In a, in a joke, in a fit, I was like, what do I have to do? Put tits and money on a record to sell it? And I was like, that's it. And I went back and wrote Power Trip, which is all about tits and money. So I wrote this satirical record about money and about tits and put tits and money on the cover. And goddamn if it didn't sell. That did it. That really did it. I remember going back in the record company and going like, you see? You know, with a little tweak in here and there, you could sell anything. So, I mean, the, the transition is, is guided by the environment of what is gonna sell and what isn't. Things changed and then those bands usually get dropped if they didn't sell and, and then you move on to the next. Whatever, it's a major label game, that's it. Okay, so the term dropped is really your drop from your contract. Um, that would be fine. You can lick your wounds, go back and start over again. But what was happening to bands like Dig and another band on our label, that band Live, Live sold like, I mean, I may be fudging the numbers because it was a while ago and I was really high, but they probably sold like 14 million their first record and then their next record sold like 7 million or 9 million or 6 million, whatever it was, it was a lot less than 14 million. That's considered a major failure to the industry. Uh, not, it's not personal, it's they get scared. So they will tend to bail. And instead of support you more, they will support you less. The major labels have no problem promising these things like complete creative control. You know, you can have whoever you want produce your record and you can have whoever you want do your record designs. But of course, if it doesn't start making us any money, then we're just going to forget about you. Well, um, this, this seemed to sink in with Todd. At some point, after seven years of slogging through, slogging around the world and, you know, crawling out of the same sewers together, Todd got it in his head somehow that he was the creative genius and we were the slackers that were riding on his coattails. One of these days, Mr. Opportunity gonna be knocking on my door. One of these days, I'll... Every band comes through, you know, the trials and tribulations that, that are similar within reason within different, you know, different bands. Some bands 
are going to bicker over the finances. And some bands want to eliminate that, which is what Course of Empire did, and said everybody gets the same. It's equal. It makes it very simple. Um, I don't know what the dynamic would be if we had done otherwise. It would be maybe like, why isn't my song on this record? Or you took that part out because you want more publishing, and it, it became it could become very insidious. And ego definitely played a huge role in it as well. Uh, I think the intensity led to the demise of the band. One more sunlight, I, my experience in failure is like no other experience in a band. We weren't necessarily nice to one another, but we weren't necessarily mean. We were just being honest and forthright, and we just communicated like adults. Um, we didn't take anything personally. The only personal thing that was going on was how can we start and finish the best song possible? Um, you know, sometimes things would be taken personally, but, you know, that happens when you've been locked in a house with somebody for six months working on an album. It, along with that came, like, you know, different mix of, of chemicals, you know? It was like, uh, there were a lot of drugs in the band. Um, Todd was more uh, into, like, you know, drinking and, and speed-oriented things, you know? And, and uh, Nats and I were more into depressants and opiates, and, you know... We wanted it, it being success and accolades and you know the, just the joy of creating you know we wanted that so bad and it became such a huge part of our lives so fast that it, it I think it played a huge part in eating us up. I think it's true that we started to tear at each other and blame one another for like well this is this is your fault. If we had done this differently on the record, if the record had been more melodic, if the vocals had been better, if the guitars had been this way, you know, we, it would have been a larger record. But, but the tension within the band, because we were just sitting there doing nothing, uh, not touring, not writing, it, a lot of damage had been done. Um, and that, I think that, more than anything, killed the band and brought out the worst. It's all. And, it's all related to what the music business was doing at the time. If Nirvana didn't get huge, that never would have even been an issue because no major label would have ever wanted us in the first place. I've never played in a band that was so musically tight and on the ball. You had Peter coming from Helmet, Pete coming from the Cro-Mags and Murphy's Law, and Tom from Quicksand, and I kind of had a melodic vocal style. When you mash that together, uh, it created this kind of interesting thing, which is what I think made Handsome stand out from what else was happening in New York City at that time. What a great record. 
Pete Hines playing drums on it from the Cro-Mags. I mean, really a brilliant record that I thought could be, you know, super, super um, commercially viable. I mean, the band, the, the band split up for all the stupid reasons that bands split up, whether it be, you know, money, dissatisfaction, drugs, all the stupid shit that breaks up a band. But I mean, you know, let's, let's face it, they were also pretty awesome. I can't, I can't talk for other bands, but um, I'd say there were many ways that Handsome made things difficult for ourselves. You know, we did sign a $1.2 million deal with Epic, and all we needed to do was to keep it together. But because we had signed to a major at that time, there were expectations within quarters of the band that we were going to sell 4 million records, and when that didn't happen, uh, I think people started tearing each other apart. I mean, God, you know, there were people got punched in the head in the back of the van. All the infighting prevented us from making our own decisions. People got put in rehab. People broke out in the eczema. I mean, you know, we had a myriad of problems happening. People were masturbating in other people's socks on the bus. And that's insecurity, you know, biting away at the at the band when I think we made a great record. You had the opportunity of, fuck, who, who cares? If you sold 20,000 records, 200,000, 4 million, 20,000, you could get, still go back. So look, we're in a band, we can do this. All we need to do is get together in a room and not be fuckwits. So, somewhere between 95 and 99, there were guys that got mad if they got offered a record deal that what didn't start off at least at like two hundred fifty thousand dollars for your first record? Like they were, like upset. Like we're not going to take that, yeah. and would turn these deals down. Yeah. Just because it, you know, because well, those guys got two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Yeah. Are you kidding? Like, it was it, 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 <laughs> it was crazy. Bands. <laughs> I guess that just after Nirvana had run its course and that whole wave of bands, you know, up through like Smashing Pumpkins and that whole kind of class had sort of run its course and had made their millions. Uh, Green Day came through and I think somewhere in that time just too many bands had gotten signed and that whole cynicism on part of the on the part of the industry which you know is always going to exist because it's a business had really infected the uh, the actual talent pool. Especially in 91, 92, 93 before Nirvana like really exploded. It was honest, and it kind of lost that once once that whole scene was commercialized. Um, and it really hasn't come back since. I think what caused the biggest problem in the band was the two and a half years between records. Uh, had major labels that wanted to buy us out of Century Media, and I had no problem being on an independent label. It was not an issue for me. My problem was they had no idea what to do with us, and they were just letting us sit there to rock. Ironically, three or four years after we disbanded, there were a ton of bands that sounded like we did like, seven years earlier. Own Living Witnesses, you know, still cast a very, very long shadow. They're still cited by members of Close to Gage, Shadows Fall. Met basically, a lot of people from, from bands that went on to become much bigger as a big, big, big influence. Um, but Own Living Winners is a great band that didn't get um, the, the, the attention that they deserved. Another band that I think got caught up in the bullshit of the record industry. And if they didn't sell, you know, 100,000 records on that first record, they were done. 
that's why the industry changed with the internet because it gave it gave the bands more power even though people now steal everything but still uh you can start a following again whereas the labels were like no here's this like they're waving like a golden carrot in front of you and you're like yes please like yeah sign us up big stages big studios big budgets like radio tv great because we got something to say here but if they decide to pull the plug for whatever reason now you're stuck and things start falling apart put the carrot in front of their nose like here's a bunch of cocaine here's a bunch of hookers you know it's all good but uh it makes you forget about what you started doing in the first place and why you got to that point. And at the same time, I'm not going to say with Dig specifically, but a lot of these bands at the same time, you've now reached the apex of the early 90s drug addicts. What's your name? Secret, what's yours? Do you think uh, masochism at all? Huh? Do you think getting beaten? Uh. When I make an album, first thing I do is I smoke a lot of pot, pot, like pot. too much pot. I want something different. I want something special. Oh no, honey, not for ten bucks. I can't forget that the amount. Of, when I moved to L.A., look, I was a, I was a rascal. I was a party and I was a, just a, a wild boy. But coming to L.A., it was a whole other level of debauchery. I mean, I, there were some bands I, I knew that were just their liquor budget for doing the record was more money than White Zombie had ever been advanced for anything. And I don't know what it is, and it's if it's, it's the music, it's the vibes, it's you know, it's the fans. It's just it's just this energy that just creates these monsters. I don't know the history, the legacy, all that. All I know is I showed up in '91. And by 93, I was as strung out as the rest of them. By 96, I was a bad drug addict. By 98, I was hopeless and, and not in any bands. Let me tell you something about these stories. They could be a lot of fun to a lot of people that listen to them. But it ain't that funny when you in the whirlwind of the crazy of the drunkenness, of the drugs, of the hoes. But you know, as we know, there's only one Keith Richards and, and there's 100,000 boys that have died trying to be Keith Richards, you know. I don't know, ask me something else. And... You know, a lot of my funny actions, like putting my balls in people's face because they're getting on my goddamn nerves. It's funny to people, but to me, it's an annoyance. You've all exposed each other and you know each other so well. If things aren't right in the nucleus, things won't be right, period. What you don't understand is where everything is leading. When all of the signs you see still point to The first time I ever seen Cop Shoe Cop was, I think, at the Pyramid Club. But what really turned my head and really got me into them was the Ask Questions Later album. That Room 429 song was like, to me, it was just like amazing. We got back in the studio rehearsing and making new material. You know, and the band started uh, started fraying. At the, uh, at the heart of it, I think it was um, Todd really wanted to be doing another type of music, which he's realizing firewater. We had made arrangements to sit down and talk things over at a cafe, and we were sitting there for about half an hour, and uh, this, this woman showed up with a note. Uh, from Todd basically saying, you know, I want to talk to you guys about a lawyer. Saying uh, essentially that it just wasn't worth it. 
And at that moment, while he knew that all of us would be preoccupied waiting for him to have a discussion about what he was on about, he went down to the rehearsal space, grabbed the expensive uh, sampling gear and that, and uh, left. That was virtually the last I ever saw of him. And record companies, also in those contracts, had something called a leaving member provision built in, meaning that if any member of the band was a signatory to the original contract leaves, the record company can void that contract without penalty. So, the uh, big evil major label in Los Angeles was not the hand that wielded the knife that put <laughs> went into my back. That came from within, because I never had a chance to sit down and even talk to him. He was cowardly to the extent of not even sitting sitting down over over lunch to say just what what the fuck was going through his head the easiest route is to feel uh like angry you know um and uh you know it, it caused a lot of um a lot of pain Interscope just decided not to, you know, it was, it was they, at, by that point, they had uh, gotten wind of our drug use and, you know, big fucking surprise there, it took them that long to feed that a band called Cop Shoot Cop might be using drugs, but, um, it's not, it's, um, it's not what interfered with the creative process. Um, it was it was a real act of betrayal. You know, Todd and I just just started talking again, I'm, and I'm at the point where it's like, okay. All that stuff is behind us, you know, and there's a reason why, uh, it's like relationships, there's a reason why we were making music, there's a reason, there's like a com some kind of, there's a commonality, you know, there's a, a similar way that we uh, saw the world, how we, you know, envisioned things and heard things, you know, and, and we can now once again, like, communicate and, um, you know, be civil be friends whatever you know and, and um, you know that, that sometimes only happens uh, through time it takes time I think most of the underground bands that were signed apart from the initial rush of which Helmut was part uh, who were signed with majors were, should have probably remained that under band and they should have maintained their fan base and their ability to be independent and not become dependent on funding and money and pampering for major labels. We had a very fortunate experience on a major label. Everything went really well. We didn't get screwed, you know, and I, I can't I can't complain. Everything everything worked out very nicely for us. But I do I do know some bands that once they went to a major they basically got kind of shelved and that's a nightmare. <laughs> Having your album shelved sucks. So I'm sure it's happened to a lot of bands, and it's nothing new. But yeah, it's 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 uh, it's incredibly uh, disappointing. But you know, luckily we were able to move on from it, re-record a new record, and you know, Network Records picked us up, and we were able to continue um, putting on music. To look back and, and reminisce on what was bad, just it's not even worth it at this point in life, you know what I mean? It's because there was so much more that was good. One morning I woke up and I realized I was in Holland about to play the Dynamo Festival in front of like over 200,000 people and I was like, wow, like, you know, I'm not dreaming here, I gotta show up. This just happened. Like, this is just one of those surreal things in life. Like, you never believe it's ever gonna happen to you and then, well, it just did. 
for me, like, you know, meeting the Dust Brothers, I did uh, a lot of studio work for them after, uh, after we did the Sugar Tooth record. I played on the Rolling Stones record. And, uh, yeah, that's right, huh? Yeah, it was good times. It was good cash. The, uh, I played on the Hanson record. I mean, I, I played on the Howard Stern soundtrack, which I got the check for yesterday. Pay for the above ground pool I'm thinking of putting in. Yes! I'm <laughs> putting on. Business dealings aside, I mean, the, the music business has always been notoriously fucked up. But the 90s were actually, it was actually a very exciting time. I mean, all my friends' bands were signed. We were all full-time musicians and, and we were all touring together. Like the energy was great. People were discovering this indie rock thing and this post-hardcore thing and the beginning, you know, emo, like with Sunny Day. And you were discovering all these things that it just felt like the first time that these things existed. But you know, I think in the end, these bands got to make records and spend money and go to cool places and do things they wouldn't get to do and probably reached and inspired a lot of kids that would go on to do interesting bands, you know, later in the 90s or in the 2000s and stuff like that. But all those other bands that ended up breaking up or things happening, you know, they still had their impact as well. Bands that stretched those respective musical languages and sort of rewrote the language of rock itself. Here's my story, sad but true, about a girl that I once knew. She broke my heart, I became unglued. It all started when she called me. Dude. Uh, uniqueness is just something you appreciate, you know, especially my job, you know, listening to all these bands who are trying to sound like somebody else. And then you get a band like Scatterbrain, and you're thinking, you know, wow, what is this and how awesome is it? You know, a band like Mr. Bungle, same sort of thing. You, you appreciate bands that are doing their own thing. The major flaw in, in the music business is you're always trying to find something that sounds like the thing that just broke. Yeah. You know, you're trying to find that, um, you know, the next Pearl Jam or, 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 or whatever it is. I'm probably dating myself now. Justin Bieber, baby. New Justin Bieber. You know, it could be me. The new Biebs. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, it's always what's, it's, it's always chasing what's already there. And I've also noticed that the bands that resonate the most with an audience are the ones that have a kind of a, a, a pure, unique mania about them. Like a very distinctive band, with very distinctive sound, distinctive subject matter, distinctive personalities. That band is going to get an audience that is finely tuned to appreciate that band and will cling to that band for life. Please allow me to adjust my pants so that I may dance the good time dance and put the onlookers and innocent bystanders into a trance. Give the sea so the swan will marry a propagated lies. To plug for elected officials, the beast you see got 50 eyes. Bring it on home, spread the wealth, play it cool, the hands With us, I think one of the saving graces is that we always treated the music as our shield. Streets on fire, the mind goes wild, wild, wild. Streets on fire. When we signed the major labels, when we got dropped, it drove us closer together. And we thought, well, we took these jokers for a ride. They gave us a bunch of tour support. We went out with bands X, Y, and Z, and they put our records in the store with a bunch of fools. And then we went and did it again, and then we did it again, and then we did it again, until we established a base that we could put out our records ourselves. And all those bands too, like Clutch and the Melvins, like 
they they are aware of who they are and where they are and you know they're not trying to like recapture some sound that they had in the 90s or something like that they're trying to make new good records you know and and keep moving forward i know those records that we put out with atlantic and columbia i will not ever see a dime from them. and we may sell 10 times as many of those records but the ones that we saw a tenth of that we put out ourselves i can live off of that So, no disrespect intended to anybody who thinks they're going to make it, but I kind of think if you're making music and you're putting your soul into it, then you're already making it. That's just it. If you believe in what you're doing musically, you're going to find a way to, to keep it rolling. You want to make three records for a major label and be a flash in the pan and fall on your ass? Or do you want to play music for life? The beauty about what, what's going on today is there's no way around it. Like if you've got what it takes, then you have to like basically get off your ass and do it for yourself. And nowadays, bands are no longer so dependent on record sales, more dependent on touring, about having a live following, about being able to go out there and work on the road because they don't draw down record royalties. What's happened since the collapse of the physical media is that now bands are f seeing, hey, we can get by great just by playing shows and running a website and selling shirts and records directly to our audience. And today, you can have a big record on a strong indie. I mean, Arcade Fire are doing great on Merge. Bonnie Iver does great on Jag Jaguar. I mean, there is that success all around. We don't actually need a record business anymore. The record business is for chumps. It's for people who want, like, like if you wanted to get into tennis, you know, and you buy a box that has a racket and some balls and some sneakers and a net and uh, some shorts, you know, you get like the all-in-one box of how to be how to play tennis, right? The the mainstream professional music business now is for people who would buy that fucking box as opposed to people who would go and just start playing tennis and see if they liked it. And it's too easy for artists to blame labels. You know, everybody has a hand in their own destiny and nobody will ever care more about your shit than you. So it's a two-way sword. You gotta feel yourself enough to keep going and then you gotta have enough power to deal with the industry. The industry is rough. The record companies are rough. You better be rougher to be in this business. Interscope had a subsidiary label called Death Row, so it wasn't unusual to to run into these rappers, you know, hardcore rappers on the uh, elevators over there in Wilshire Boulevard to their office and so on. And the people at um, at Interscope, being new to us, you know, we were the new band on the label. They they thought by virtue of the name of the band, Cops You Cop, and we were from Brooklyn. Well, they must be a you know a real like hardcore NWA type of uh, rap band from Brooklyn. And then they get to see our video. And they say, this isn't a rap band or a Mexican marching band with a door for a lead singer. How are we going to fucking market this? A fight broke out in front of us uh, between what looked like a homeless guy and a Seattle rock kid with like long hair and a goatee. Um, we weren't paying much attention to it, but it moved down the street until it was underneath the overpass. And by the time it got down there, there was maybe 50 people or so watching it. So 
Greg and I walked down there to see what was going on with this fight and check it out. And as soon as we got there, right at the moment we showed up, the homeless looking guy grabbed the other guy by the skull and bit his nose clean off his face, uh, which immediately ended the fight. That was it, you know, and the homeless guy went, Phew! he was gone. And now there was this kid with no nose, jetting blood out like a fire hydrant, like Skeletor, screaming at everybody, where's my fucking nose? And sure enough, we all start looking around. He's screaming, find my nose. And so we all start looking on the ground and I'm looking to, and uh, because it's underneath this overpass, it's the kind of place where people naturally tend to throw garbage. Somebody broke open a whole package of uh, styrofoam packing peanuts, you know, which were all dirty and lying on the ground and it looked like thousands of noses. So I'm standing there talking to Greg again and I look down and it's right in front of my foot. It looks like somebody bit the end off a hot dog and went, ah, and spat it back out. So I reached down and go, dude, got your nose.